evening, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, and welcome to the pre-show talk for, for me, because I've already seen it, the most beautiful production I've seen at CFT this year, and possibly for many years. Um, um, my name is Kate Moss, I'm a playwright and a novelist, and it is my great good fortune uh, to be interviewing today the amazing Dale Rooks, who deserves a round of applause just for being here, thank you. <laughs> being interviewed, even by her old friend, me. Um, you know Dale, all of you know Dale, but I'm just going to do a little bit of that, I'm sorry, but I have to do that for the interview. So, um, of course, Dale is the person that has made the uh, youth theatre here the best youth theatre, I'm not biased, of course, um, in the country, but is also the director of Leap, um, but an amazing director. And last year um, had the world premiere of The Midnight Gang, as part of the festival season, the first family show as part of the main festival season. Before that, of course, had had um, Michael Monpurgo's Running Wild, which was a youth theatre production. Um, it won uh, several awards, not least of all the UK Theatre Award for Best Show for Children and Young People. It then went up into London and then went on the tour. Um, and now there is this extraordinary retreat, which is another world premiere um, of this beautiful uh, book by Michael Monpurgo, uh, the Butterfly Lion, and it will open, um, have a press night on the 14th of October and has just started pre previewing. So, welcome. Thank you very much. Onto your own stage. I always feel ridiculous <laughs> welcoming you onto your own stage. So you um, have this amazing gift for taking books for children and making them stories for everyone. So with Michael Morpurgo, you've worked with before Running Wild, just tell us a little bit about The Butterfly Lion, without giving the story away, and why this was a book you wanted to put on stage and direct. Okay, um, I should start by saying I read it at least six times. It's a, <laughs> the kind of book that you just can't put down. It's very gripping. Uh, it's compelling. The story's really compelling. It's mysterious. It's magical. And it has all the elements within it that suggested to me that it should be staged. And I always know when there's something that I hang on to because I visualise, as I read something, I can visualise some of the scenes <laughs> that I'm going to set within the play. So there's, without giving too much away, I don't know how many of you have already who, seen Who it. has already seen it? <laughs> A few. People going in this evening? Yeah, so don't okay. give too much away. Oh, right. <laughs> but it has wonderful characters and places and themes and a, a, a fantastic time span. So we are set in present day and then we go back 100 years and we work through that time span. It's very epic. Um, it's set in glorious places. So the countryside of England and... Sussex. Sussex, Indeed. <laughs> uh, and then in Africa, and then into the provinces of France. So I really felt that I could do something hopefully quite extraordinary um, with it. And the way that the adaptation has worked, it's, it's supposed to be quite slippery. So there are times when uh, we have a time stretch and a time warp, and we move backwards and forwards. And that's a real joy to work with on stage. And it's been adapted by Anne Ledwich, who you've worked yes. with before, of yes. course, and is a writer in residence here at CFT yes. at the moment. So when you read it and you started to have some of these images in your mind, do you then call Anna Ledwich, say, and say, I've got a vision for what I would like to direct. Can you write it for me? Does it work that way round? So the very first thing that happened was I had a meeting with Michael Morpurgo. So having directed Running Wild, um, which he saw, and I have to tell you this story, um, we were at Cass Sculpture Park, and he said to me and the young company at the beginning, um, I might cry at the end of the production, <laughs> and that will be for one of two reasons. Either you've completely cocked up my story, <laughs> or I'll be very moved. And he was sobbing at the end, and I didn't dare go near him. <laughs> um, but he, he was actually very moved, and he called me and said, let's have breakfast tomorrow morning, and uh, I'm coming to see it again. 
Uh, and apparently he doesn't do that. Very no, he doesn't. So doesn't. that scared me. Um, <laughs> but having made that relationship with him, he'd actually suggested that he would love to see the Butterfly Line at Chichester Festival Theatre. Um, so I guess from there, we then had to select a good writer, playwright, for the adaptation. And I knew that Anna would be right because I'd worked with her before. And I have to say, she has done the most magnificent mm. Ad adaptation. It's very truthful to the book. It really honours the story and every part of it. But she's done something very clever with it. So the characters work through three generations. And actually, I'm going to share this with you because not many people know, but it's just been published. So I have it with me here today. I'm very proud uh, that it's now uh, going to be accessible for all companies mm. to use, mm. particularly youth companies and, well, mm. adult companies as well, because it's not just a story for children. And I think that's what I love about Michael. And one, one of the things, you know, putting my writer and playwright hat on now, I was astonished by how brilliant the adaptation was because it is utterly the book, the novel, Michael Morpurgo's novel, but it is also something completely new. Um, and that's that rare beast, I think, isn't it? Yeah. So um, it's so hard because those of you who are about to see it, you are honestly going to be blown away, particularly by the lighting and other types of the design. Um, so we don't want to spoil it for you. So there are many questions I'd love to ask, and I will ask you in the post-show interview, but can't ask now. But just for the audience here, once you and Michael have decided and everybody agrees that it's a show that you can do here, who then comes into the room? Is it the designer? Is it the music? Just tell us a little bit more about how more and more people come around the table. Yes, it's a, a group of creatives, and I have to say they are truly, truly magnificent. Every single creative that I'm working with uh, is at the top of their game, and they just create wonderful things that textures uh, the play. But also I have the most wonderful actors, the, the company, the cast that I'm working with are incredible. Um, but yes, I've, I've lost the question. Well, no, no, just one, no, no, I mean, you've answered the question, which is, I think for, uh, for people who don't make theatre, yeah. it's the idea of how you start off with just Michael Morpurgo writing his novel, then yeah. you coming into the room, then other people. So when, once you've got a creative team together, you said you could imagine certain scenes in your mind. Mm -hmm. So do you say to your wonderful designer, Simon Hicklett, or the composer, Tom Brady, do you say, I would like you to design me this, this, and this? Or do you just share your enthusiasm and set them free to come out with ideas for you? Well, firstly, it's about everybody reading the script. So we had draft one. Uh, this has been uh, this has been in the making for about eighteen months. Yeah. <laughs> so we're on draft five, but actually draft one was a really good one to work with. So the creatives came together after they'd read the script, and then I kind of put my vision onto it. And one thing I did say was I wanted it to be very minimal. I didn't want a large set. I wanted the space to be very free so that we could really invent and create things uh, as a company, as an ensemble. So that was our starting point, that we would have two features within the story on stage. And it's as bare as this for most of the time. So you can see we have a tree. And the reason for that is that I could see that we would use it in all the three countries. And then we have uh, a table and some stools. Again, it's a focal point for the things that happen within the story in the three countries. So we started with that. But I also had a really strong vision about how uh, video might work with the piece. Because we're transported so quickly through different worlds, I and wanted time. to find yeah. uh, the convention that would allow that to happen. Uh, and this is our convention, it works wonderfully well. And um, Tom Brady, who's our composer, has created magnificent work, um, which textures and, and just adds, you know, the emotional content to, to the piece. Yes, and with the, um, 
the focal points, it seemed to make so much sense that this is a story about one boy, but it's also a story about all the lonely boys yes. and all the lonely people. Yes. And it's a story about memory yes. as well. Yeah. So with those kind of themes that lie behind it? Do you just let the actors discover that through the text? Or do you say, could you go and do some research into what it would have been like to be at boarding school in Sussex or what it would be like in Africa at 1897? It's a little bit of both. Um, one of the important features of putting on a new play, and this is a world premiere, mm. it has actually been performed before somewhere, but very different to this, um, it's really important that we do our research and that there's great planning involved. So we, um, I think six months ago, we had some development weeks. So I asked a group of actors, actors to get, come and join. And we went to London and we spent a week in a rehearsal room playing with the ideas around the text, playing with the music, playing with the words, playing with the movement. But when you say playing, what do you mean? So you just know? experimenting, just putting things on its feet. Uh, we, we did a little bit of reading of the text, and then very quickly I wanted it to be in front of us so I could just see what, what ideas worked um, mm. and which didn't. Mm. And that was really crucial to the making of the piece. Um, and then we did a similar thing with puppetry. We do have some puppets in the show. It wouldn't um, be a Dale Rook show without a puppet. <laughs> um, and again, I wanted them to be quite skeletal mm. uh, to um, just complement the design. Uh, so we had a few days here, and I worked with the youth theatre members with our wonderful puppetry director, Nick Barnes, and we just experimented with the ideas mm. that would work mm. for us. So that, that was a really, really crucial stage. I don't... I don't know how you could go into a new piece of work if you haven't had that time mm. uh, in mm. development. Yeah. And you, you mentioned your extraordinary cast, and I mean, the adult cast is fantastic. Uh, Nicola Sloan, who plays old Millie, yeah, who's she's, she's kind of the anchor of it all, and she is extraordinary, I thought. But you also have some exceptional young actors. But of course, uh, things being as they are, you need to have teams of young actors. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit about how you work with two groups of children and how different is the piece depending on which cast is on? Yes, obviously uh, there's a different dynamic I think for the adult actors depending on which team. So basically we have ten children in the show, uh, four of them are constant so they play the bullies <laughs> and then we have two teams of three, and they have quite major characters, so they're playing the younger versions of the older characters. So they're introduced in that way. Um, and they're really, they're terrific. They are mainly youth theatre members. We have two from outside youth theatre. But they're very disciplined, very respectful. Um, they understand the professional process, and so they work very well with the, the adult cast mm. and the adult actors are brilliant with them too so yeah it's very integrated but it's um one of the things i i found it so moving when i saw it that i you know staggered over to dale virtually in tears <laughs> um at the end of it uh, but i think the thing that really got me that i think you have done so beautifully is that if someone said right we're going to show you more than a hundred years of story in a couple of hours we're going to show you one or two, even maybe three versions of the same person. Mm -hmm. We're going to go backwards and forwards between countries. It sounds like it would be really hard to follow, mm -hmm. whereas it's one of the clearest stories I've seen on the stage. So with the movement, which is an enormous part about how the younger versions take over from the older versions and things, did you work with a choreographer or um, a movement director? How did you get all of that very complicated moving people in and out of their roles? Yes, we have a movement director on the show, Kane Husbands, who I've not worked with before. Um, so he's really helped to choreograph the space and particularly passing the baton over from uh, the younger actor 
to a middle actor, to an older actor. I mean, Nicola plays uh, old Millie in the story, and so basically she narrates through the whole piece. And she's on stage all the time with the yeah. younger Michael. Yeah. Um, but she's the custodian of this story that needs to be handed on very carefully to young Michael mm. Mm. so that that story mm. will remain. Um, and that's, that's part of, I suppose, the concept of uh, the chalk line on the hill, mm. is that it's never forgotten. And it's the, I mean, everybody who's read any Michael Morpurgo or seen any of Michael Morpurgo's adaptations or films knows that there's often a young boy and an animal relationship mm -hmm. at the heart. But f for mm -hmm. me, it was the young boy and the old woman that was so magical. Yeah. You know, that she saves him yes. and he saves her yes, in a weird absolutely. sort of way. Yeah. Um, and there is a wonderful twist that we won't spoil. Yeah, there's a great, <laughs> great twist about at the that. end of the story. Like you really have to think about when you leave it, and that's the great thing about theatre, isn't it? It's got the power to do that. And I think with, with Michael, I'm a great fan of Michael Morpurgo. I don't think he shies away from difficult issues. Uh, he pre presents stories that are for children and for adults, uh, not just children's books. All adults read his books. Um, and I think he, because he bases a lot of his, his ideas around uh, real stories, mm and real life events. Um, and he manages to magically sort of intertwine those with fantasy. I think he, he, he's a terrific novelist. And I think what your production has done, when you read Michael's text, any of his books, they are straightforward books. Mm -hmm. But watching it on the stage, it is a piece of quite exquisite magic realism which is amazing transformation. And I know that Michael Morpurgo will be here to help, you know, to celebrate on your opening night, but he is so thrilled with this, isn't he? Is that a nerve wracking thing for you when the author comes in <laughs> for the <Apparently>. first time? <laughs> yeah, it's really frightening. Um, so do you sit there watching him, trying, you know, <laughs> trying not to look at him? <laughs> Try not to watch him. I mean, he's, yeah. But when he comes into, you know, how many times does he come into the room and see at what stage? So he came into rehearsals uh, and saw a, a very short um, scene that we were working with. Um, I was very excited, but he does keep in touch. Mm. And um, he, I think he knows a few people who have been to sh see the show. So, yeah, hopefully he'll be... And if a writer, I mean, if someone like Michael, who of course is, has written more than 130 books, he's sort of, you know, OBE was the children's laureate, he, you know, he is royalty um, in this. If he said, you know, Dale, I don't think this scene works, I don't like it, would you change that or would you try to explain why you and Anna, the adapter, had made the choice? How does that work with a living writer? Because often you're working with dead writers as directors. Yes, <laughs> uh, I think you have to respect um, you know, the ideas and thoughts of the writer. And if it was something that he, he really believed in and I hadn't quite achieved it, I guess there would be negotiation there. But luckily it didn't happen. Um, but it, it did, well, I don't know if it'll happen on this. Cause it's <laughs> um, hopefully he, he will find it moving and powerful. And, I know that he loves the adaptation, so I think we're halfway there um, because he knows that it's really embraced mm. the beautiful novel. And, and of course, I'm sure many of you know this, and there's a wonderful note from Michael Morpurgo in the programme, so you should all get your programme. Um, but he wanted to be an actor, and his father appeared at CFT uh, right back in the day, very early on. Um, so he, And he, of course, has a long association with Sussex as well, so there's a great deal of love for here. Um, in his work, yes, isn't there? Yeah. Um, before I take some questions, and particularly if any of the younger people in the audience would like to ask questions, I'd like to give you the chance first. So start thinking of, of your questions if you want to ask one. Um, for you as a director, you have an amazing uh, track record of, of wonderful uh, productions, some with hundreds of, of children, some obviously slightly more contained like this one. Um, when you move a new piece of work, and it's such a, a wonderful thing to be seeing a new piece of work from the rehearsal room into the theatre, and you start watching it as we do from 
the stalls. How much do you feel you can change things? Because it's a complicated show, isn't it? <coughs> you know, and it, but it must feel different in here yeah, from the rehearsal room over there or over there. Yeah, I guess, firstly, the complication of it is that the actors are playing so many different roles, so actually blocking the scenes and uh, making sure that <laughs> the journeys for each actor work is quite complex. So if they go off there, they can't come on there one no, second later. Uh, yes, and they have to go under stage and come back on another way because we don't have room on yes. stage to uh, send people off. So it's it's really complex. One of our actors comes on, he plays a giraffe, he <laughs> plays a, a worker in Africa, uh, then he's a soldier, a colonel, a doctor, yeah. a teacher, <laughs> and he's running about backstage kind of... And, it, and, and, I, and I guess, yeah, the complexity of it meant that I wanted to keep it simple in terms yeah. of yeah. costume and, and changes. But your question um, about the rehearsal room is when it comes into the space, things do change. And I think the lovely thing about having so many previews is that you have time to uh, amend things. And we've been tweaking today and yesterday and the day before and tomorrow. Uh, right up until press night on Monday. So anybody who's seen it, if they're coming back, they will see some quite significant changes within it. And I'm very critical of my own work. So when I sit, the, the, you know, I always have notes and things that I know I really want to improve and improve and improve until I'm, I'm absolutely satisfied with mm -hmm. what, what, what's being created. But, do you but that's not just me, that's the whole team. You know, it's everybody involved, and I think the joy of this piece is just the collaboration um, with the production team. They're absolutely immense. It's very complex for a deputy stage manager to be calling such an epic show, um, but they are truly brilliant. You know, the thing is, I, I said this to you afterwards, it is brilliant. What you have done is a, bit, a piece of magic. I mean, people are going to be blown away when they see it, I think. Yeah, I, I've yeah. told you my Michael Morpurgo story, haven't I? Of, um, you know, in the days before Michael Morpurgo was famous Michael Morpurgo, and before I'd written a novel, we always used to do literary festivals together, and we always put on in the graveyard slot, which is <laughs> nine o'clock on a Sunday morning when everybody is not up. And he said, you know, the thing is, I had one of the best phone calls of my life, Kate. Uh, the National Theatre rang up and said they wanted to put one of my books on stage. And I said, that's amazing, Michael, that's going to be completely fantastic. And he then said, and then it was the worst moment of my life, because they told me they were going to do it with puppets. <laughs> that was War Horse, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so there we go. Um, I'm afraid that I've got to bring it to a close. We we're doing a very short one today because of the company warming up. Um, but it is quite genuinely one of the most magical productions I have ever seen. Um, so you are in for a treat, and Dale Rooks, you are a marvel. Ladies and gentlemen, Dale Rooks.